introducing the target genre, which is the interactive science documentary. And I'll be dealing with the two main components of this genre. The first of them is the science one. So, as we all may know, in recent years, both academic and vernacular genres uh, have expanded their reach uh, within the web uh, in terms of communication of science. So, this process of remediation, that is, of all the genres going online, uh, has already been adverted. And what is specific, specifically being acknowledged by some research is the adaptation of academia specifically into a wide array of semi-formal and informal channels of communication, as you can see there. Uh, this includes blogs, uh, mailing lists, and so on and so forth. So, this paradigm, this inclusion of uh, scientific genres, scientific academic genres into the online sphere has produced a boundary erosion. That is, the discourse that was one reserved to the scientific spheres is now being, let's say, contaminating, forgive me for the connotation of this word, of uh, less people's discourse. So I decided to study this interactive science documentary because they are part of the opposite tendency, that of genres, which are not scientific or academic, but rather vernacular, and that uh, have taken place in the web and deal with scientific communication to non-expert audiences. That is, they are committed to the democratization of science. Accordingly, my first aim of the presentation was to categorize the ISO as a parascientific genre and to locate the scientific contents within it. In terms of the second affordance, which is that of interactivity, I based my analysis on the hypertextual affordances. And most interestingly, uh, as a study by Snyder and Finneman, I was concerned about the change in the stances. So we as traditional readers, when we read a text, for instance, uh, a, a book, for instance, um, we are usually in the browsing stance, that is simply going through the pages. But what, in, in, what interactivity and hypertext affords is to the, is to this navigating stance, that is clicking through hyperlinks and, you know, this non-linearity. So, if we tie this uh, metaphor of the navigator stance with the interactivity, we can see that this can be related to the genre theory, that is goal orientedness and the genre's communicative purpose. Within this democratization of science, we are now uh, giving power to the people. And so the documentary and interactivity contribute to this uh, change in the, in the paradigm. Um, since my studies are uh, following the rhetoric tradition, I decided to also study the documentary contract as the objective of the social need, that is, the social, social exigence that these genres must develop and which fulfill the genre's communicative purpose. I'll come to explain that later. So, you know, these genres exhibit these engagements with science. They are not concerned about making people experts on the issue, but rather just uh, giving certain uh, guidelines on the use of science and some affordances and how it could be used to lay people. But what has not been studied so far, or which is something which is uh, relatively under-theorized, is the connection between this public engagement with science and the interactive affordances. There is no correlation in the study so far. So I decided to, the second aim of this presentation is to analyze the co-construction of scientific knowledge through interactive affordances in such emergent genres. So, uh, in order to do that, what I decided to do was to create a case study methodology based on Nash's uh, interactive and web doc structure, which uh, offers three different structures for web doc, and Miller and Seppert uh, rhetorical genre analysis, which is based on pragmatic action and the social exigence. This may sound more familiar. So I decided to use case study methodology because, as you may imagine, this kind of genres uh, do not do not offer such prototypicality. They are very variable in the in their sense. But as I will come to argue, they show some instances of uh, centripetal and centrifugal forces that contribute to the stabilization of genre. So I know these three categories were analyzed: the structure and uses interactions, the location of scientific contents, and finally the pragmatic action of interactive elements. Um, the selected interactive science documentary then was The Last Generation, which is a uh, documentary which deals with the conditions of life in the Marshall Islands as uh, islands which are threatened by climate change and flooding and this 
natural phenomena. So, in terms of the results of the analysis, uh, and as I've said, uh, the first one, which was the narrative structure and user's interaction, um, the most suitable structuration, which I uh, uh, observed within this IS doc, was the narrative structure, uh, structuration. So, I addressed this issue by this, uh, by analyzing these things mostly. First of all, the subject matter and the order of events uh, propose this chronological sequence. The event, or in spite of it being a collaborative tool, which is something very important for these emergent genres, this, pre this precise documentary offers a chronological sequence. Uh, mostly, this is achieved by the creation of expectations in two parts of the documentary, which are present and future. You can see it in here. The documentary acts as a triptych, and so there are different ways to access this knowledge. So, the expectations that are created in present and future act as a sort of cliffhanger, so to say, in order to provide sort of narrative structuration to the documentary, and also some closing sequences. But apart from this narrative, what we can encounter are some complements, that is, the read more, explore, watch, which are different kind of multimodal resources together with infographics. So narrative is actually complemented by uh, some instances. This is the uh, presentation of the mayor layer, layer sorry, within the text. And this, uh, if you can see here, the read more button, redirects this kind of uh, function to other uh, scientific contents, as I will come to explain right now. So as for scientific contents, I decided to divide them into syntagmatic and paradigmatic location. So syntagmatic locations were those in which or which are directly embedded within the narrative. There is no need to interact with them. And what we can't what we could find within these syntagmatic locations were mostly maps, infographics, and also participants' testimonies. So these testimonies, uh, interestingly, follow a pattern of similarity and of structuration, which is kind of uh, important to acknowledge because these genres do not do not usually show this. Uh, kind of patterns, and this was a case in which they did. So, this sequence, as you are seeing in the testimonies and skippable scenes and read more button, was a uh, certain resource that was used. And you can see here this specific infographic, which, of course, in this part, leads to a read more uh, location. The most, probably one of the most interesting results of this. Uh, analysis was to locate the scientific contents within the paradigmatic locations, that is, the ones that we have to click in order to access them. So these paradigmatic locations uh, of, uh, or are structured in terms of read more buttons, which redirect citationality and disclosure in, towards professional scientists, and explore and watch button, which provide visual evidence. So this is an example of the read more button. As you can see here, the kind of style that is employed in this slide, so in this piece of text, is completely different to what we have seen so far, which was uh, more structure around infographics and video also. <coughs> this is the explore, for instance, the explore button, which provides different visual evidences and the kind of uh, yes, presentations and photos which provide evidence. Finally, I decided to correlate the pragmatic function of these interactive elements to the social exigences of the docu documentary, that is the documentary contract, as I uh, mentioned earlier. So the first pragmatic action, that is that of interacting with the text, uh, and which is related to taking action, which is the first clause of the documentary contract, is mostly realized through scrolling. So here we are correlating two elements. The first one, documentary's intent, that is we as an audience must take action into the real world, and the affordances, the interactive affordances of the web. So we are taking action into the documentary's narrative just by scrolling. So there is actually a perlocutionary effect. This is the pragmatic effect of this specific, uh, of this specific action. What this allows is to build knowledge at a self-paced and active role uh, on the part of the audience. Secondly, documentaries must be objectives. So how do we achieve objectivity in these specific documentaries? Uh, it is realized through the aforementioned explore, watch, and read more buttons, and because they provide textual evidence. So, perlocutionary, the perlocutionary act in here is that of citationality and also that of building trust with the audience. Well, because they are providing evidence, that's mostly the point. The third pragmatic action, that of the uh, most of these, um, let's say, 
uh, embedded uh, genres within Web 2.0 is realized through this, uh, this story button, uh, which allows interaction between audience and potential users through social network insights. You may you might have seen that there are these integrated buttons that allow the to us to uh, share the documentary via Twitter, via Facebook, which is something that uh, most of these genres offer nowadays. So in these three minutes that I'm going to speak left, I'm just going to uh, go over the interpolation kind of quickly. I mostly acknowledge the existence of uh, two processes, that of the boundary erosion and the story, storytelling techniques in scientific discourse. So in terms of the boundary erosion, what I came to discover was that there was a process of hybridization when in these specific products. Why? Because on the one hand, they were including this journalistic audiovisual grammar, that is, including testimonies, interviews, and so on, but also scientific discourse on the other hand. So, secondly, uh, I was concerned about the use of storytelling techniques for scientific discourses, because on the one hand, uh, they serve to increase effectiveness of communication and also engagement with contents, which may lead to uh, high retention of contents. But on the other hand, this could be kind of tricky because we may be situating the audience within our views. So this could be tricky and could be, you know, kind of a fallacy, the use of these uh, storytelling techniques. In all, interactivity is have to increase engagement. That's something that is obvious. But what is important to acknowledge is that this engagement did not overload the audience because the documentary limited the choices by the user to just uh, some buttons. So this was not an overload, but it is a kind of fun platform to interact with. There is a reduced number of paradigmatic choices, as you can see here. And also it is constrained by how information and rhetorical formulae work, work within the text. In terms of the communication of scientific contents, which was pro something that was proved within this analysis, was that the documentary was more concerned about creating a narrative than on providing scientific knowledge. Because these scientific contents were mostly located at paradigmatic, lo at paradigmatic locations. That is, you should interact, interact with them in order to arrive uh, to them. And, you know, these paradigm lo paradigmatic locations offer something that was kind of concerning, let's say. That is, uh, in spite of all of the interactivity that we can find within the text, the read more uh, section is the one that offers the most uh, scientific information. So I was uh, still wondering, or something that crossed my mind, was this thought about the hegemonic discursive form of written text, even in this highly multimodal, highly audiovisual text that we are still employing. You know, the written form is still uh, the hegemonic discursive form in this kind of text. And Finally, the uh, something that was mentioned in, that was mentioned before was the integration within social network insights. That is within a paradigm, an internet paradigm, which favors this competition for appeal and attention. The genre, this I stock genre, may be uh, lacking in this scientific content production, but in spite of this uh, over reliance on scientific communication. So this is the conclusion that uh, I finally reached, which uh, allowed me to uh, align this specific documentary genre within the parascientific genres, which, as I've said earlier, uh, consist on this uh, erosion of the boundaries of this course. So uh, that's pretty much it. This is the kind of uh, thing I was mentioned earlier, uh, as referring to the to the charts and how the the kind of language changes in this hegemonic discursive form. And that's it pretty much. This is the references in case you want to check them. And mm -hmm. that's it. Many so thanks, you. Alfonso, uh, for your uh, interesting presentation uh, with uh, some very, really nice news, pieces of news on, on this kind of topic. We have time for a couple of questions if you want. Um, I, let's see. Uh, Carmen Guinda says, Alfonso, tu referencia de Miller es Lindsay Miller de Hong Kong. Together with Christoph Hafner, he has worked extensively with students in science documentaries, a central activity in their uh, subject of scientific communication. There you can see the naive filmmaking uh, strategies in Hong Kong students. Hmm. Uh, and 
we have a question by Luis uh, Serra. How Swales theory, discursive community, gives contribution to the work? Hmm. Eh, la respondo en español, si os parece. Sí, sí, claro, claro. Vale, eh, sí, Carmen, eh, sobre todo... Eh, sobre todo porque en Hong Kong presenté también este tema y tuve la oportunidad de hablar con Chris Hafner sobre el tema este de, de la comunicación científica. Evidentemente ellos están más comprometidos con multimodalidad, que es a mí un tema que también me interesa bastante, pero yo decidí tirar por la parte más de retórica, por decirlo así. Y estoy más comprometido con... comprometido, con todas las comidas. Eh, con la parte de decir, vale, cuáles son los objetivos sociales del género y cómo estos objetivos sociales se trasladan a la propia interfaz, es decir, a lo que Internet nos permite hacer, ¿no? Entonces, sí, por una parte, la de, la, es un poco naif, ¿no?, eh, lo que hablábamos con Chris Hafner, pensar que, que esto es un trasvase que sea one to one, pues cuando estaba eh, atendiendo a la ponencia que has explicado antes, pues ya lo comentabas, ¿no?, más o menos, o ya dabas esa idea. Entonces, sí, no, no, no puedo estar más de acuerdo con pensar que estos géneros, al fin y al cabo, eh, tienen un in una intención un poco naif, sobre todo en un mercado de, de sobreconsumo, ¿no? Como es Internet y con estas predatory tendencies. La segunda pregunta, ¿me, me la puedes volver a repetir? Perdón. Sí, era eh, cómo la teoría de Swales, eh, uh -huh. de la comunidad discursiva, eh, puede contribuir al, a contribuir al trabajo. Hmm. Pues, ojo, pues agradezco mucho la pregunta porque es algo que, que, que la llevo pensando mucho tiempo. Yo, más allá de la idea de comunidad discursiva de Swales, a mí me gusta más la que da Miller. Eh, creo en 2016-17, creo que tiene dos obras que van sobre eso. Pero no hablamos de comunidad discursiva, sino de comunidad retórica. Porque creo que el cambio que ofrece la comunidad retórica con respecto a la discursiva es la proyección virtual. Y me explico. Eh, no necesitas tener una comunidad de hablantes que interactúan necesariamente entre sí. Yo lo que venía a decir en este documental es que, vale, tenemos interactividad, pero no tenemos interacción. No tenemos a participantes que para co-construir los contenidos científicos necesitan hablar entre sí, sino que son relaciones virtuales, ¿no? Sí que están integrados en otras... Eh, eh, ¿Cómo decir? En otras partes, pues por ejemplo en los social networking sites, pero desde luego no... No, no, no creo que este fuera el caso, ¿vale? Entonces, estoy totalmente de acuerdo. Swales nos puede ayudar mucho con las comunidades discursivas, pero creo que Miller, en estos géneros online, eh, con su definición de las comunidades retóricas, nos ofrece mucho más. Y, última reseña, si me dejas, eh, creo que el tema al que ayuda mucho, sobre todo, es a una cosa que también ha comentado Carmen, si creo recordar bien en su presentación, que era sobre temas de autoría, creación... Eh, quién es ahora el creador en unos géneros en los que tú tienes que dar input y que luego ese input pues, se utiliza para más, eh, eh, yo qué sé, creación de significado científico o contenidos científicos. Me parece muy interesante, desde luego. O sea, que muchas veces por el apunte porque es algo que es algo que, que, es algo que llevo considerando. Y, y sí, sí, pues eso, que muchas gracias. Todo lo que sea crossbreeding viene bien, ¿verdad, Alfonso? Desde luego. <risa> muchas desde gracias luego. por tu presentación. Gracias y a pasamos ahora a Damaris que creo que ahora parece que puede presentar. Vamos a ver si hay suerte. Sí, sí, se te ve. Muy bien, perfecto. Y si quieres esperamos un minutito, que es y media tu presentación, ¿no? En teoría, seis y media, sí. Y son y 28, vamos a esperar un minutito. Está ahora es en negro, a ver. No, ahora sí, perfecto. Sí. Esperamos un minutito y empezamos, ¿vale? Damaris. Perfecto. Nos va a hablar sobre definiteness and specificity in Costa Rican EFL learners. Bueno, pues cuando quieras, Damaris, puedes empezar. Gracias. 
So as, as Francisco was saying, I'm going to be talking about definiteness and specificity in Costa Rican EFL learners. Um, I'm Damaris Castro and I, uh, I'm, I work for Universidad Nacional in Costa Rica. The structure of this presentation would be as follows. Uh, first, we will have some bibli bibliographical references, then a description of the study that I'm working on, some preliminary results and preliminary findings. So, as we all know, uh, word languages can follow different kinds of patterns to mark definiteness and specificity. That is how we use articles to associate with nouns. Uh, there are different kinds of patterns. Some, some languages use, um, like Spanish and English too, we use definiteness as, as the base. Some other languages do not mark for either one of these. And some other, mar um, some other languages mark using uh, different kinds of, of uh, object markers. Uh, so, when we are learning a new language, what we have to do is that we need to remap that information that we have in our brains so that we can adapt to that uh, new system that the second language grammar demands. Uh, when we have two article uh, languages, like, like is the case again of Spanish and English, we are going to group those articles based on either definiteness or uh, specificity. In the case of both Spanish and English, we mark the system uh, based on definiteness. And because we categorize the, the articles in that same way, we would uh, we usually find that um, for Spanish uh, speakers of, of English, uh, we are it's relatively easy for us to mark definiteness. However, when we analyze uh, the use of, of articles in uh, even in advanced learners, we still find problems. And the main difference between Spanish and English is that while um, English doesn't allow this, Spanish allows definite and indefinite markers to mark uh, uh, plural nouns and mass nouns. So we would expect that to be the main difficulty for Spanish learners who are learning English. Now, uh, it has been proven for, for a long time now that the first language exerts some kind of influence over the second language. So that part is not new. We know that, that there's influence from the first language that comes into the second language. The, the situation now is that um, in the case of articles, there seems to be a very important uh, effect in, in, in or difficulty in terms of understanding articles. And that is, um, there are many different systems that are part of, of assigning article marking that makes this um, this particular uh, part, a form of grammar to be uh, more difficult. Now, like I said, English and Spanish uh, share the same system, and we know that uh, Spanish learners can transfer the knowledge from Spanish into English. But despite this ability or this capacity that we have of tra transferring that knowledge from the first language into the second language, Spanish learners um, uh, of English still struggle with article marking, even at very advanced levels. So, um, SNAPE in 19, uh, 2019 show, uh, shares this uh, graph that we have there, where he shows how many aspects are involved in the marking of, of articles. We know uh, in, in the section that you see in darker, um, in darker uh, black, that represents the core grammar system that we have. And all of these elements are going to come into play when we have to decide on which article we choose. And the connection between syntax and semantics, syntax and morphology, even phonology, is all related and it has to account also for the use and, and the information that context provides. So as we know, this multiplicity of factors have an effect on article choice and that may hint at the, at the necessity that we may have to include direct instruction in the learning of, uh, of articles. Now, what I'm looking for in this study is uh, we have three main questions. The first one would be to determine what is the overall behavior of article use in the subjects of this study. We also want to see if Costa Rican students behave in a similar way to to other Spanish students who have been involved in previous studies. Uh, Costa Rican students have never st been studied in this field before. We also want to see if the results that we have show some kind of significant problem 
in the identification of zero marking for verb plurals and mass nouns, which is the main difference between Spanish and English. Uh, in this study, we are working with students from an English major at Universidad Nacional in Costa Rica. We are following these students over a four year period. Uh, we are working with 48 students and their age uh, is the mean is 20.1 and the median is 19 years old. All of them university students. Uh, for the methodology, first, we worked with um, three native speakers who, who worked as a control group. Once the native speakers had uh, taken all the tests and we had uh, received native like responses, we, we piloted the test with two groups of students from this major who were not, who are not part of this study. And uh, during the study, the subjects took the test in individual sessions taking between 30 and 45 minutes to complete each one of the tests. The, the samples that I'm showing were collected in 20, October 2019 and October 2020. So the first test, first the tests were assessed manually, then we checked the answers using n-gram to check which of, which of the answers was more common than the other, and then we realized some statistical analysis using IBM SPSS 25. So the base for this study is what I'm showing you here. This categorization was created by, is presented by Hawkins in 20, uh, 2001. And um, he is going to be dividing the different types of usages depending on the interpretation that, uh, that um, English articles have in terms of specificity and uh, learner knowledge. So the first group would be a definite, uh, would be describe definite specific uh, nouns those that are known both by the hearer and the speaker. The second group describes indefinite specific nouns, those that are known by the speaker, but it's the first time that the hearer uh, is presented with the information. Then we have the definite and specific, which is the generic interpretation, that um, noun that we can identify, although we do not have one particular noun in mind. And we also have indefinite generic, which is the one where we don't have a particular uh, noun in mind and the, the hearer cannot identify that noun either. So in this study, we uh, the students completed 42 short dialogues where they were asked to provide uh, one article, a, uh, and, that, or zero, depending on the, on the dialogue. In all of the items, the third uh, sentence was the one that was missing the article, and students were asked to provide the one that they thought was needed there. Uh, these type of items have been used in many studies before, uh, such as Garcia Mayo or, or Yoninko and Bexler in 2003. And different types of nouns were included in these tests. There were abstract, mass, singular, and plural nouns in the items. So these are the results that we obtained. For the first con construct, between the first and the second test, we see that there's a, a, an improvement, a statistically significant improvement. This is the, the definite specific noun. And um, we also have a uh, statistically significant improvement for the, the um, definite non-specific type of noun. And as you can see, the indefinite nouns in both of the tests are the ones that obtain the higher um, number of correct items. So it seems like it has been proven in other studies that indefinite articles seem to be easier to identify than definite articles. And the ones that are known both by the speaker and hearer, which can be identified, reduced to just one single noun, is a little bit easier for students than the one of generic um, noun. Genericity has been studied um, lengthy in the, in the last years because that is the one that has proven to be more difficult for many students. Now, I'm going to skip this one. If you look at this, uh, this is the behavior that we have for the, for, for the results in different tests. As I said before, you can see the red line is the one that represents the definite specific uh, nouns. And this is the one that shows a significant improvement in the second test. Same happens with the definite um, generic noun, which is the one in light blue that you can see also shows a statistically significant difference. So we see that there's clear improvement for definite nouns. However, the indefinite nouns do not show statistically significant improvement. That is, they seem to, to be at a plateau in terms of improvement. 
And also we can see based on these percentages and compared, comparing them with previous studies that these students in this uh, study are getting lower results than students from, from other studies. When we take a look at the different items that have presented, the ones that, that presented the lowest scores for each one of the, of, the, of the tests, we see that these examples are, should be very clear for students because at least in the first one, there's a very clear first mention of the noun. So this one would require the use of the here, although students do not uh, obtain that, um, that response. And this is a very frequent uh, problem that students face because they assume that plural nouns should be bare. So they have been told that English nouns in plural should not be accompanied by a, a pronoun. So many times, even when the, pro, uh, I mean, when the article is needed, uh, they miss that article. For the second construct, the indefinite specific, uh, here again, remember that in this case, the, the, the hearer cannot identify the article based on the context, but the speaker has one particular noun in mind. So in this case, again, this should be uh, receiving an indefinite interpretation, just as this one. Abstract nouns seem to be particularly difficult for students to assign an article to. Again, based on the fact that most of the time we are told mass nouns should not be accompanied by an article. In the case of the third construct, and this is the one that has been extensively studied in the past, uh, the students also obtain uh, low, um, lower results. If you see, um, students tend to use in contexts where that is not needed, but in the case of Spanish, we would use it in that context. And same thing happens here where we are thinking of one particular professor, if we use that, but the context refers to professors in general. So it should be, again, um, indefinite, generic. The fourth one of the constructs uh, is the one that would require an indefinite generic interpretation. And here, uh, again, the students tend to choose the, which would be the option in Spanish, and that is not possible in this context because in both cases, we are not thinking of one particular uh, type of oatmeal or a particular group of babies in this case. So in general, what we find is that the subjects exhibit an average rate of correct answers, answers that range between 60.8 and 100 for test one and 44 and 100 for test two. So some of the students went down in the, in the number of correct items in the second test. And also we find, like I said before, that compared with previous studies, these students are getting a much lower uh, percentage of correct items. So what we think he, we, ha we have been analyzing different possibilities. So like I said, we range between 60 and 100. If we look at results like the ones that are presented here for for Yonin et al., for example, they range between 87 and above. And in the case of Garcia Mayo, she reports over 199, 93.75 is the lowest of her percentages. So in our case, we are very far apart from the results that, that have been obtained before. And also we find, we would, we would expect that the zero marking for mass and plural nouns would be the most difficult item, but it is not the case. We see that students have the same degree of difficulty across the board with different types of articles in the system. Why we have these different results? Uh, we have different, we, different possibilities. One is that in some of the previous studies, students have been immersed in the culture where the language is spoken. So this may help students um, reach a better level. And also some of these studies have concentrated on just one specific type of nouns, not looking at the whole paradigm as we have in the in this in the case of this minutes. study. So clearly, okay, so the, yeah, this is the end. So clearly we need to to find ways of improvement. And like I said before, um, Snape and other authors have shown that uh, direct instruction is needed, explicit instruction is necessary. And that is not necessarily the case in our program where uh, articles are, are studied in connection to other topics, but not um, independently 
as, as students seem to be needed in this case. So this is uh, this is all. I, this is uh, some of the bibliography oh. that I have mentioned. Many thanks, Damaris, uh, for your so nice you. presentation. Mm -hmm. Very very timely, of course. Uh, one of the topics that uh, suits uh, the topic of the conference. We have time for a couple of questions. If you uh, if you want to type them on the chat facility, um, anybody wants to ask uh, Damaris anything? In case you don't have questions, I may add uh, something just to show you how we are working with the engram viewer. And okay, once we have um, these these results. Um, in the cases where two options are, are possible, we use these engram results to, to create oh, a ranking nice. of which one mm -hmm. would be more likely to be used by native speakers or just in literature in general, which is available in Google. And, and this would tell us which of the two options would be more likely to be used by native speakers or by uh, advanced level speakers. And so that way we are also moving um, towards analyzing our context in comparison to to other contexts. Mm -hmm. Okay, many thanks, Damaris. It doesn't seem to be any questions. So thanks everybody for joining us in this uh, session. I'm going to stop the recording, and you should get.